sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Amen. Hallelujah, God. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise, please? Amen. 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 Thank you. And thank you. Um, first and foremost, I bless the Lord God today uh, for the opportunity to share with everybody here. Uh, thank you for so graciously extending this invitation to me, Pastor Paul, and to all of you here at Hughes Memorial. Uh, you guys are like a second family to me because um, I get to work here once a week uh, with a co-worker of mine named Rachel. And we work for an organization called Project Transformation. Uh, and you all so humbly and graciously let us use the office space upstairs. So every Tuesday, we get to see the great work that you do. Sometimes, you know, we may get a little taste of the food, uh, but this, this is a great, great space. So I just want to um, honor you all and say thank you today. And thank you to the young men. Can we affirm the young people too, please? But how wonderfully um, and beautifully they read the scripture. So today, what I'd like to speak about, or what the Lord has placed on my heart, um, is the conversation about the significance of courage when it comes to our own healing, and how our boldness in chasing after and going after healing can open doors to freedom and liberation that we never before imagined or could hope for, because of God, who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you or I could ever hope for or imagine, amen? All right, so will you please join me in a word of prayer? Almighty God, most holy one, El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Elohim, the great I am. Lord, we humbly come before you, God, before we ask you for anything, to first say thank you, to glorify you for who you are, 
for sustaining us, God, and gifting us this day that is uniquely its own, God, a day that is unlike any before it, any after, and will never happen again, Lord God. At this time, God, we invite your Holy Spirit that is already present to continue to fill us, Lord, to continue to um, bring us to life and rejuvenate us, God, and restore us and show us the way. Lord God, we bless you for this wonderful community that is Hughes Memorial. And Lord, your, your humble servant asks for another chance to stand in the majesty of your glory, though I am not worthy. I pray, God, that I would be minimized so you would be maximized, God. I pray, Lord, that your people, myself included, would hear a word from you today, God. So at this time, most gracious God, we bless you. We honor you. Come into our hearts, Lord, for you are always welcome. In Jesus' name we pray. Give us courage and empower our faith. Amen. So our scripture that was so beautifully already read today comes from Luke chapter 5, verses 18 through 25. Um, and when you found it, please say amen. Um, you don't have to stand uh, unless you want to. That's totally fine, too. Oh, I also forgot to mention, I bring you greetings on behalf of Emory Fellowship United Methodist Church, um, where I'm a member um, under the tutelage of uh, Pastor Joseph W. Daniels, Jr. So I um, just wanted to say shout out to y'all from, uh, from Emory. <laughs> Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on a mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can, forgive, who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home, praising God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The scripture will serve as the foundation for a sermon entitled Healing Takes Courage. Let me hear somebody say healing takes courage. Now, I know some of y'all don't want to do this because there's probably a lot of introverts in here, but Look at your neighbor, yes, look at your neighbor and say healing takes courage. I love the participation, all right? I, I feel, I'm feeling more comfortable, all right, good, 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 okay. So healing or the need to be healed indicates that there exists a problem or an issue that has impacted the regular functioning of our being. Healing is sought whenever our being is placed into a state of distress, a state of distress that causes pain, dysfunction, confusion, and generally throws us off of our homeostatic equilibrium. I got that from Merriam-Webster. Uh, <laughs> usually, many of us seek healing when we have been severely impacted, severely impacted so much to the point that we can no longer bear the pain and the disruption of the imbalance that the brokenness has caused us. More often than not, before we get to this point, we have received some kind of warning or indication from our body and our being that something is wrong. You see, take a cavity, right? A cavity doesn't just become a gaping hole in your tooth overnight, right? At some point, your teeth let you know that there's something wrong. You might, hear, you might have more sensitivity to a cold drink. You might have a slight ache. You know, you may begin to see a little crack, but you're usually given some type of warning that a cavity is coming. But it takes a long time before we get to the point where you might need a root canal or a crown. This is coming from somebody who's had extensive dent uh, dentist work uh, because, you know, molars are a problem, but we're not going to talk about me and my teeth. Uh, but you usually are given some kind of indication that something is wrong before you get to that point. Or 
if that doesn't work for you, I'm going to pick on the brothers for a second. As men, we usually like to wait until we've reached the pinnacle of pain before we seek the advice of any kind of medical professional. Y'all can say amen, because I know y'all know some brothers. I've been one of them. We will put more weight and strain on our backs until they finally give out. We'll huff and puff and wheeze until we end up needing an oxygen tank. And we'll run our bodies from job to job, position, position, never resting until we are forced to lay down and rest. But all the while, knowing that our bodies gave us some indication that trouble was afoot in our being, and yet we fail to acknowledge or respond to it. But even though we fail in these ways sometimes, we thank God for saving grace because we know of moments where even though we've waited until the last minute, we were still healed or given the opportunity to pursue some form of healing. That's the beauty and the grace of God, but that's also the courage that we have to begin the healing process. Now, I'll admit for many of us, a trip to the doctor, to the dentist, sometimes to pastor's office, <laughs> to the therapist or to the gym, or even a simple trip to someone you need to reconcile with can really be terrifying. But just because we don't go doesn't mean that the issue we need healing from will go away. Amen? You know how the famous saying goes, pretending a problem doesn't exist doesn't make the problem go away. If a building was on fire, you could turn your back to it all you want, but the building's still on fire. Jesus calls us to be bold in our faith in him when it comes to his provisions and way making for our healing. But the first step of that call is to take the first bold step out away from fear into faith. Somebody say, walk from fear into faith. Amen. Now, I was led to this text today because of its setup. So um, I'm a person who loves to tell stories. I love imagery and I love background. So I'm going to set the tone for us for a second, just so we can kind of get a visual of where we are. So Jesus in his ministry has made his way on his journey to Galilee. Now, up until this point, we've seen Jesus perform miraculous healings of many people who were sick with all kinds of afflictions. We've seen him cast out and banish demons that were impacting the souls of people and sucking the life out of them. And we've also, up to this point, seen Jesus commission the first disciples. Now, let's go back 2,000-something years. Here we are in Galilee a mountainous and rugged region. If you've ever spent any time in any kind of region that's mountainous and ruggy, um, rugged, you know, there's uh, holes and rocks and you got to go up and down and the streets are uneven. So he's walking this path. And now that Jesus has made it to this place, his presence has amassed a large crowd because word of mouth has spread of the power that he has to heal people. Now we've all seen crowds, we've all been a part of crowds, and we recognize that sometimes crowds can become so massive that they're one attitude away from becoming a mob. Crowds can bring chaos, they can bring noise, they can bring disorder and difficulty, and sometimes they are so large and frustrate us to the point that we like to turn back from where we originally um, were intending to go because of the intimidation of the size and the, and the difficulty of the crowd. So, so far, we have a mountainous, rocky region with unlevel ground, rocks all over the place, potholes and things of the sort, probably, probably like a DC street. We see that this area is filled with a bunch more of more than likely somewhat disorderly people who are loud, who are probably pushing and shoving, um, and who are just really hard to get through. And then we also see the presence of people who seek to protest the authority and the capability of Jesus to heal. So you got rocks and holes, a whole bunch of loud, disorderly people, and on top of that, people who are protesting who Jesus is. So the first thing that I want to take away from this scripture and for our message today is that the journey to healing will come with the difficulties. That's the first thing. The journey of healing will come with difficulties but we must courageously be willing to get through these difficulties. Much like this crowd, we will have our own noise that we have to get through. We'll have our own barriers that we have to get through. And we have our own reasons to turn back from that what, what, which we've been um, boldly called to face, but we must continue in spite of the intimidation of all that we face. So now enters our friend, the man who is paralyzed. 
Now, there are many things about this man that I don't know, but being a human who has had, um, who's had to travel distances to seek professional help um, of all different kinds, I've waited in lines to be seen for hours, um, and I know to an extent what it is like to seek help, um, to seek reconciliation and restoration with no promise of success. I can only imagine our brother has had quite the difficult journey to get to this place. That mixed in with the probability of the gossip that Jesus was a fraud and he doesn't really perform miracles. I'm sure our brother in his journey, and let's not forget that he was paralyzed, was not 100% sure that what he journeyed for would promise him the outcome that he was looking for. Or maybe he was certain. That's the beautiful thing about not knowing when it comes to scripture sometimes. You're left with the open-endedness of interpretation. But one thing I do know for sure is that this brother was courageous. Now, what I do know about my man is that he had a real tribe with him, which brings me to my second point. We need a tribe of the tried and true. We need a tribe of the tried and true. We need folks who will support us on our journey, who will walk alongside us, who will do the digging with us and the peeling back with us, and who will lift us up when we cannot stand to give us the courage to go forward. Amen. The text says some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So, somebody said so, they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat into the crowd right in front of Jesus. These brothers are what you would call real ones. And I know some of us know what it is to have real ones, A1, day ones, ride or dies, homies, you know, your, your BFFs, whatever you want to call them. These are the type of folks who will go with you courageously into that journey of healing. These are the folks who will fight with and for you, who will not only drop you off at the destination, but make sure that you are seen. These brothers not only carried this man to the crowd, but when they saw the crowd was too massive, they lifted him up onto the roof. And then when they saw that the hole was not big enough to lower him through, they did the extra work in pulling back the tiles so that he could get through. And after this, they didn't just drop him down because it would have been easy to just drop him. Look at what they did. They carefully and strategically lowered him before Jesus. Now, these details are important because it shows us that who is around us in our journey to healing, who we lean on in our journey to healing, who we entrust with the carrying of our stuff in our journey to healing, who we believe in enough to walk courageously with us in our journey to healing is important. You can't trust everybody with your stuff. You can't trust everybody to just be there for you. You need a solid team. You need a solid team of brothers and sisters of faith. So this year, I attended three great events that were centered around the healing of Black men. One was called Just Hillbro back in May. And Just Hillbro is an event that focuses on the general mental health and well being of Black men, uh, Black male wellness, and things of the sort of all ages. The other event was called I Wish My Dad. Now, this event was a, a book signing at my church last week uh, for a book that was based on conversations uh, with Black men uh, who shared their stories of what they desired for their relationships with their fathers, whether they were absent, present, alive, or deceased. And the third was an event called Restored NYC, um, which was a faith-based event that was designed for uh, men to reclaim our uh, sonship with God, to reclaim that relationship um, as sons of God and going forward from that place. Um, being a man who was raised without his father, I understand all too well uh, the pain that fathers who are absent by choice leave on a boy and later a man. Um, I understand the desire as well for sonship. Um, and when it's not given to you, the work that is needed to be done to reclaim that, uh, the work that is needed to be done to um, reclaim that healing and that position um, as a son of God and things of that nature. 
So needless to say, I found myself for many years seeking out spaces where I could be with a cohort of men um, who knew what this felt like, who identified as I did um, to discuss these different kinds of, of issues in the hopes of healing. After a few years of searching, maybe plus or minus the pandemic, you know, it was a very different year for many of us. Um, I found these three spaces in the same year. I just consider that a move of God because after searching for so long, after, after denying myself the opportunity to be in spaces, after giving up, um, when, you, when you pick up that faith once again to find the healing you're looking for, um, to find whatever it is kind of healing that God is calling you to, God will deliver. And he delivered for me three times this year, back to back throughout the whole summer. So I just praise God for that. Um, but of the many wonderful things that I noticed about these spaces, I noticed one specific thing. Each one of these events were able to happen because of a solid team of brothers who were committed to the healing of not only one another, but of the souls of the men that would find themselves in the seats of these places. Restored had brothers Ezekiel, Reginald, William, Darius, and a bunch of other brothers as well who brought their gifts, their hopes, their hurts, their talents together to create this spaces this, this space because they saw a need. I wish my dad had Ramal, Jordan, Joe, Rob, and many other brothers who put their stories on the front line so that the brothers could be set free. Just Hill Bro had Jay, Lamar, Lawrence, and brothers from other um, interpretations of the event who sat on a panel to openly discuss their traumas and their tribulations, ranging from attempted suicide to sexual addiction to substance abuse and many of the things that brothers and people in general suffer with in silence. All of these spaces were formulated by a dependable tribe of brothers who were tried and true. Remember, you need some tried and true folks who lifted and continue to lift each other up no matter the length of the journey, the weight of the problem or the tiles that they had to dig through and pull back. But most importantly, and this is the most important part, a point of this sermon, the foundation of these spaces is faith. Each one of the brothers that I spoke to about their why, yes, they listed the hurts that they had. Yes, they listed the traumas. Yes, they listed what he did, what she did and how he was wrong. But they always mentioned how God had brought them to this space to make these things happen. Restored, Just Hill Bro, Ramal Toon's book, I Wish My Dad, all began with faith. The third point is faith is the foundation for the courage to be healed. Faith is the foundation for the courage to be healed. Our scripture says, when Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, there are many theories about why Jesus may have forgiven the sins of this man prior to healing him. Some people believe that he had committed a sin that led him to develop a health ailment within his body, which ultimately led to his paralysis. Others believe that his paralysis was due to a sin he could not seem to forgive himself for or get over, like he was stuck because of the sin. Some even believe that his paralysis was metaphorical and stood for an emotional state that he was in. So it was like he was frozen in time because of whatever he had done. While many, many, while many still believe that he was physically paralyzed as well, no matter what your interpretation is, one thing we know for certain is that our brother could not receive his healing without his foundation of faith to courage. He couldn't get where he needed to without faith as his first foundation to get to his healing um, and without the courage to get to that point. Family, to seek out healing means that we have to face the reality of whatever has gone wrong. And we all know that that is not a really, ever really, a really easy thing to do. It's not a pretty thing to do. It's not a fun thing to do. To do this is to tell fear, shame, guilt, and pain that I'm willing to stand face to face with you and fight for my life. I'm willing to face the dragon of hopelessness with God as my sword and my shield, with God as my rock, with God as my strong tower, and I'm ready to swing that sword and rip you to shreds. 
I will face you fear, shame, guilt, pain, and whatever else. I will fight you and I will be victorious. You will be victorious when you stand in faith and walk in courage towards your healing. But the battle can only begin once we take the first courageous step in faith. Faith, faith also calls us to face all that afflicts us. Faith calls us to go to the dirty places of our soul, to those grimy, dingy spaces with the things that we're afraid to talk about with those things that enrage us, with those things that bring us shame, with those, thing, with, with those things that make us afraid to even mention them to people for fear of how we'll be judged. But the beautiful thing about Jesus, the beautiful thing about Jesus that you can't offer and I can't offer is that when we give a yes to him, to courageous faith, he can transform our hopelessness and fear-filled situations into new life. We've seen it countlessly throughout the scripture. Those who were afraid because of how society treated them, those who had given up, stepped out on faith, the paralyzed man, the woman with the issue of blood, the woman at the well, the men who were blind, all of these people reached a place of desperation and they walked in so much faith. Now, mind you, these were people who society called dirty, they called them disgusting, they called them cursed, they were downtrodden, they were ostracized, they were everything that you can imagine as deemed undesirable. But just the touch of his garment, being lowered before a crowd of a whole bunch of people, speaking to someone that others said you probably shouldn't speak to, that faith got them where they needed to go. That courageous faith got them the healing that they needed. So my partner, Rachel, who I told you earlier, I work with in Project Transformation, gave me permission to tell this story, so it's okay. Um, like I told you all, uh, one of the gifts that I have from Hughes Memorial is that uh, the organization I work for called Project Transformation um, gets to work out of this office upstairs once a week. So, and also, um, and thank you again for this, Hughes Memorial has been a site for the Project Transformation Summer Camp many summers in a row. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for that as well. I'm just beginning this year, uh, but Rachel has told me the phenomenal work and love that you show those kids and the, and the part that you play in their healing. Because we know children have trauma as well. We know children deal with issues too that they shouldn't deal with because they're kids. But you all have played a part in their, in their continued success. You played a part in their deliverance and their healing and all these things. So I just wanted to offer my gratitude to you for that. So anyway, this past summer, Rachel and I had a work experience I have never experienced before. And I've worked some jobs. I used to do trash. I used to work. Um, if you've ever worked in retail, you know that that's a war zone. I used to lift furniture. I used to work in higher education and all these things. So I've had my share fair of experience in dealing with people. So we had many kids who returned for summer, right? Some that you may know or recognize. Um, and the kids were phenomenal. They were just, just gifts. We also had a cast of new interns who were in their late teens and early 20s. Well, the summer was truly like an imitation of life with many ups, many downs. And when it came to the way some of our interns interacted with one another, sometimes we never really know where we were gonna go with that. On the days that they were great, they were phenomenal. And on the days where things weren't so great, they were borderline awful. And don't worry, I've spoken with, this, with them about this before, so I got the clearance for this story. I got the clearance for the story. Um, our interns who we met in the beginning of the year had gone from this initially excited group of 20-somethings who were ready to take on the summer, ready to work with kids, ready to share their gifts, to this unrecognizable, dysfunctional cast of characters. Like any group, interns, church, work, basketball team, football team, dance troupe, any group you can think of. When misunderstood differences in experience are put at the forefront, they lead to gossip, which then leads to drama, which then leads to an implosion of the team. At first, Rachel and I would have discussions with them and they would bring petty stuff to us like, uh, he ate my chicken, he ate my chicken, she didn't sweep, he used some of my body wash. And no matter how we encouraged them to talk things out about the small issues they were having, ultimately the volcano would erupt. And our once happier summer family was wounded in ways that began to impact their work with the kids. 
Now, knowing that the success of the program was dependent on the healthy functioning of our interns, Rachel and I knew that we had to intervene. We knew that we had to go there. We knew that we had to go there with them and that it would not be pretty. There would be tears, there would be potential yelling, there would be disagreements, and every other undesirable form of human expression that we can think of that exists. Because who wants to be yelled at? You know, if you're not somebody who can console somebody who's crying, you don't want to be cried at either. Uh, you know, you know how it is. So anyway, but ultimately it had to be done. And if it wasn't done, our summer 2022 internship would have been go and engulfed in flames. So we, we did a tactic. We put some snacks on the table because, you know, food always makes people calm down or makes them happy if they're in a bad mood. Um, we put on some, some um, calm lighting. You know, we had the chairs and everything set up nicely. And we had a lemon squeeze. I know many of you probably know what a lemon squeeze is. But if you don't, it is an opportunity for a team to share all their grievances completely openly and authentically, usually moderated by the team leader or like some other kind of source of, um, of a proctoring. So during our session, um, through the tears, through the silence, through the tantrums, through the disagreements, and all else that happened during our session, we ultimately made it to the other side. We called our interns to be bold and courageous in their expression so that we could heal our team. And in that call to faith, we would require courage. We would require to pull in their courage and their faith. We began to function again. Now, after that, everything wasn't perfect. So this is not to say that the minute you step out on faith and step into courage towards your healing, that it's going to switch like that, because that's not always how life works. But things do get better. And for us, it did get better. In that faithful call to courage for healing, we found that our interns dealt with physical abuse. They, they dealt with overbearing family pressure. They dealt with oppressive and, and um, um cultural differences that put a pressure on them that they felt that they couldn't live up to, and so many other things that people walk around with on a daily basis that they don't tell you about because they're afraid to, because they don't feel like they have the space to, because they're not encouraged to have the faith to talk about these things. We had to lift, we had to peel back, and we had to lower our circumstances faithfully before the feet of Jesus. Healing no matter what level it is, whether it's your family, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a work relationship or whatever kind of healing that you need takes courage. But through faith, you can get through it. You can walk on this journey. And just like Galilee, the journey may not be clean, flat land. It won't be um, nicely cut grass. It won't be a paved road. Sometimes there's cracks and rocks and holes. And sometimes you got to get through some trees to get to where you got to go. There will be roadblocks. There will be obstacles. There will be doubt. And there will be uncertainty. There will also be people to naysay, just like we saw with the Pharisees. Say, what you need to go to therapy for? What are you talking to her for? You know she don't change. You know, mommy doesn't say this or daddy doesn't say this or your brother, he's just this way. Well, why are you trying to make up with her? Remember what she did? You're going to have obstacles and you're going to have people trying to hold you back from getting that, getting that work in and getting that healing that you need. There will also be days when you feel like giving up. Outside of the paralyzed man, and because we've all been in crowds and things like that, I can imagine there were people who also wanted to see Jesus for healing who also had an affliction of their, of their soul, of their skin, of their body, or whatever, that they wanted Jesus to take part in the healing and removal of. But maybe they didn't make it that day. Maybe their patience didn't allow them to. Maybe their faith didn't allow them to. And they turned back and just went on in their lives. You never know. But family, if you and your tribe, because we know that God has des the, um, designed us to be communal, right? The fact that we are a church shows that God desires community and that we cannot and should not try to walk it alone. If you and your tribe keep your eyes on the healing power of Jesus, we can make it. I got one more short story for you, and I promise I'm done, Paul. <laughs> when I was a teenager, I told you all that I was raised without my father. And for many years, I went searching for him um, because I knew that he lived in the same city as me. I knew that he was not far, and I knew him up until I was seven. He went to prison. Everything after that didn't hear from him. Right before I went to college, my mom found my family, and they were staying in the Bronx. 
So naturally, when you don't see somebody for a while and you know there's some kind of tension that exists there, you, you're a little afraid because you don't know how they're going to receive you. You don't know what this is going to be like. Long story short, or as my friend likes to say, long story less long, even though my stories are never less long. Um, we get to the Bronx. I'm waiting at my grandmother's house on that side of the family. My uncle from my father comes in um, and they're Dominican. So they're like, yo, yo, ow, your son is here. My grandmother doesn't speak any Spanish. So she's like, um, oh, Elia, so good to see you. Oh, come on, stop me. You know, so I'm just like, I don't know any Spanish. So I'm trying to speak, you know, we're trying to connect and everything like that. Um, so I'm sitting on her couch and I see hear my uncle Jose calling my father. He's like, yo, ow, your son is here. Your son is here. So I'm getting excited. My mother has brought me, my brothers are with me. And he's like, my father goes, I'm coming around the corner. I'm coming around the corner. I'm coming around the corner. One hour turns into two, two turns into three, three turns into four, four turns into seven, seven turns into nine. And he never shows up. He never came from around the corner. So needless to say, I was furious. I was angry. I was hurt. I was all these things. Um, and I promised myself that when he died, I would never go to his funeral. Well, fate would so have it that my father passed in 2011 before we were ever able to reconcile. And it took a very long time for me to get to this point to be able to say this because I'd been carrying that weight for so long. Because when you don't express the stuff that you need to get out, when you don't go to Jesus in faith to say, Lord, I am hurting, Lord, I am tired, Lord, why? Why me? What did I do to deserve this? That thing will eat you up on the inside, no matter what it is. And so I thought about it because for a long time, I felt that I lost. I felt that I lost the battle. I felt that I missed out. I felt that um, I was shortchanged. But sometimes we have to reimagine and reword narratives in our mind. When things happen to us, when people do things to us, when people walk away, when they leave us in a state of weakness, you got to take hold of that thing and reimagine that to make yourself victorious, not to live in la la land, but to say, you know what, this did happen. But at least I sought him out. At least I don't know what I was getting, but at least I tried. At least you're trying. There's no promise that when you step out on faith for the courage to be healed, that things will go the way you want it to. Because we serve a God who does things his way, right? When's the last time you plan for something and God's plan matched perfectly with yours? I can't think of a time for myself. But the important thing is that you try and that you have faith. And though the healing may not be instantaneous, you'll find that God will put you in spaces and give you opportunities to meet people like myself um, earlier this year when I met the brothers who can help you in that healing who you can encourage and who you can, who you can empower and who you can encourage and embolden in faith. So I say all that to say, family, be courageous, be bold in faith and be healed in the name of Jesus. He's just waiting on your yes. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Haven't we been blessed on today? Didn't God move in a wonderful way? Oh, come on. He might not have told your story, but even as he told his story, how many people knew that you could envision your story? Most of us have had some drama in our lives and our families in which we are still healing from, amen? And he just gave us a free therapy session, amen? We thank you for that on today. Thank you, Minister Elijah. I'm going to invite Minister Elijah to come forward one more time and, and to just lead the invitation for Christian discipleship, however the Holy Spirit would have him to lead that invitation at this time. Amen. Amen. This faith walk is a beautiful thing because the world makes you think that you are alone in your struggles, in your trials, in your tribulation. But Jesus calls us to bring him our burdens, to bring him our ugly parts, to bring him the things that make us feel undesirable. But the beautiful thing about that is that we get to do that, but we get to do that in a community as a family of Christian brothers and sisters. Hughes Memorial is a beautiful place with beautiful souls. And I know that Pastor Paul, our ministry team here, um, everyone who is someone who uh, supports and is a part of what makes this community grow would love to walk alongside you um, if you are feeling the call on your heart to follow Jesus, 
to love like Jesus and to lead others to Jesus. So today, if you are feeling any inclination, any pull, any tug, um, whether you're home virtually with us, uh, you can put it in the chat. Um, if you are feeling any kind of pull from the Holy Spirit to say yes to Jesus today, to say yes, or to even renew and restore your relationship with Christ, uh, we would invite you forward at this time. Amen. Can we affirm our sister, please? Amen. Amen. Amen.